Welcome to Sundance, everybody. My name is Hyla, and we are here uh, at the Adobe Pillow Talk in the Airbnb house, Sundance 2016. Uh, just so you guys understand what's going on around us, it's kind of a madhouse. You can't see it, but the snow is starting to fall. It's Saturday is one of the busiest weekends of the festival. And joining me in bed, I'm very excited to have a couple of filmmakers that have a film that everyone's buzzing about, Lewis Black. Is here, of course, Karen Bernstein. Uh, you guys also might know him, Lewis Black. He is the founder, one of the co-founders of the South by Southwest Festival and the Austin Chronicle. And Karen's no slouch. She's got a couple of Emmys and Grammys that she carries around in her pocket all the time. <laughs> I'm very excited to have you guys. Yeah, we're excited to be here. Excited to be here. Very nice Thank to you. meet you. Right. It hasn't been since my 20s that I met strangers in a bed for the first time. <laughs> So this is this is a treat for me. This is very nice. It's a very comfortable bed. Um, it's, it's we may nap yeah, off we during may it. Fall it's, 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 that's it's, okay. You know, totally fine. It's like it'll be like watching very, kittens sleep. It's a very very yeah. It lends an air of authority to the thing if you actually fall asleep. Yeah. Now let's talk about this uh, this up and coming guy you guys discovered, Richard <laughs> Linklater. You are doing a documentary, well, you've done a documentary on him. It'll be premiering here at the Sundance Film Festival. Let's start at the beginning. Filmmaking in Austin in the 80s and 90s. Sex, drugs, and filmmaking, what was it like? Everything was being done in New York or LA, and here's this guy who somehow puts together a crew, figures it out, and does stuff that is kind of uh, the, the genesis of uh, low-budget independent filmmaking. Austin in that area has a real history of independent filmmaking with things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right. And there have been stuff in like 81, but it really comes together um, with Rick in, in 89 and 90 when he shoots Slacker, and then especially in 91 when he decides to stay in Austin. So suddenly you have one of the most talented American filmmakers. Uh, working off the beaten tra trail, and because Rick stayed so involved in the community, was you know very involved with the Austin Film Society, very involved in giving back, helped create a community of filmmakers that's kind of unique and still resonant. Uh, Karen, can you talk about the access? Can you talk about, you know, were you guys shooting him? Is this just a bunch of uh, uh, film that you collected and put together? You know, how, how did you approach him with this? Because, you know, directors, there's a reason they were behind the camera. They usually like to stay there. Yes. And making him the subject, what was that like approaching him with this project? Well, he's, he's, he's well known as, as, as talented as he is and as approachable as he is. And he's really, he's just a genuinely nice guy. He's also one of the most shy, sort of off-camera people you'll ever meet. So, you know, it was not something that he hopped to do, let's put it that way. But I think because, as Lewis said earlier today to somebody else, I think because, mainly because he trusted Lewis so much and he really liked me and he did like the work that I did. I mean, that made all the difference in the world. I think if we had been people that he didn't know, he probably wouldn't have trusted it as much. And once he kind of signed on the dotted line, so to speak, and we were really in his life and in his work, um, he really, he gave over in a way that I haven't seen too many subjects ever do. You know, he wasn't controlling, he didn't try to manipulate, you know, he was really hands-off. Which and, is very uh, difficult for yeah. a director, obviously. Yes, very, very. That's in their that DNA, really that's what they yeah. do for a yeah. living, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, we're here at an independent film festival and everything is, is about kids just grabbing a camera and shooting and it, it doesn't matter the resources you don't have to have the best equipment kind of talk about his early days and how he was able to just gather a group of people figure it out and make it happen and boom magic you know one of the really important things is you can make films anywhere and the tools are more accessible than they ever were but the stories are still what's so important right. and with Rick at a certain point when he decided to be a make films, he devoted his life to watching movies. He was watching between one and three movies a day for years, and, and probably to some extent still does. And so when he really began to conceptualize his films, he really knew what he wanted to do. And with Slacker, it was some 16 equipment and they found some film, but you know, between all, everybody having different pieces of equipment and them assembling it, it was really a homegrown operation mm -hmm. done, you know, with friends on the sly, and and you know, and then it, 
it, everything changed when it was finished. Yeah. Uh, another key to his success, and I want to just, you know, play some footage here while we're talking, but another key to his success was the ability to discover talent before it was discovered. <laughs> I mean, Ben Affleck, uh, McConaughey, uh, Judy Delpy. I mean, there's a list of people that were nobodies. Parker Posey. Parker and Posey. Exactly. Yeah. And he had them in his film. What is it about him that he can find that, that rough diamond? That's a, that's a great question. And, you know, uh, Lewis sort of watched it in action. But I think that... Um, He's really, I mean, this is one of the big themes of our documentary. He's an incredibly intuitive director. He can, he casts really well. And I think it's because he reads people really well. And he's always been a lover of characters and characterization. And and also just a genuinely, I, I always said to Rick that he could have been a very good documentary filmmaker because he's a terrific interviewer. Like, he knows how to get the best out of the people that he's working with. And I think that's what he saw. Like he saw in these people greatness, you know? And in, of course it came true, you know? Someone was talking to me the other day and said, you know, there's not much narrative in Rick's films. And I said, that's ridiculous. The thing in Rick's films is this narrative is centered in character. Mm -hmm. He's not, the, he doesn't want to tell you a story. He wants to take you on a journey where you meet a whole lot of people. And in a way, their narrative is the greatest, the greater narrative. Yeah. And so when he's casting actors, what he's looking for is so special. And he's so in tune to what it is that he doesn't really care that much about resumes or credentials. It's, it's somebody who can really do the part. Yeah. And so, uh, and it's always interesting when he casts, because, you know, to watch the parameters. Sure. Well, mm -hmm. we'd love your questions. If you're watching this right now, leave us a comment or a question in the comment section, and we will read it here live on the air, uh, anything you want to know, now is the time to ask. Another <laughs> skill set, which not a lot of people have, but I feel like, like you kind of need it these days, especially to get up and running, is he would wear a lot of hats. Writer, director, producer. <coughs> those, are, those all necessarily don't <laughs> go together. But for some reason with him, he was able to execute all of them amazingly. Well, I mean, yeah, I think that's the auteur part of it, you know. I mean, he was, he, he started as, well, he really started as a baseball player, you know. He wanted to be a major league baseball player, as he says, in the, and he played, played baseball on scholarship, you know, that's how he got into college and so forth. And, and then he went from that to being, but it's simultaneously, really, he wanted to be a writer. He wanted to be, write the great American novel, right? Yeah. And so that filmmaking becomes an extension of all of that in many ways, you know. Um, so I don't think he saw a big shift one way or another. At one point he wanted to write plays, right? He had aspirations of that. So I don't know. And you're, if, you know, in your experience, Lewis, is that a pretty typical? You know, uh, uh, it's only a handful of directors wear all those credentials well. Right. There's a lot of them where they have all those credentials and their films suffer for it. Um, and there's certainly some who have more and handle it, you know, better. But the reality with Rick is he does what he has to do. So if he has to right. produce, he produces. If he has to write, you know, and he always has scripts, but he's always developing scripts with other people. You know, so it, 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 you know, one of the things you realize with a filmmaker like Rick, who's incredibly resourceful, he still hasn't made the films he wanted to make, he's made the films he got to make. Right. And that's different. Makes a huge difference. Uh, yeah. I, I know you guys, we have another member of the filmmaking team here, uh, yeah. right? Because I'm worried that we don't have enough people in the bed. Yes. <laughs> so what I want to well, do is try and cram in one more person. We can make it happen. Come on. Get in here. We can we can do this. We can do this, Karen. We can do this. Yeah. Hi, Lewis. Very Hi, nice. Lady. Very tight. You? Very nice. Tight and cozy. It's cozy. It's oh wait, cozy. did wait did we lose Karen? I know. No. Karen oh, no. just like jumped out oh, of the hot oh, seat. Oh no no. This is like a hot bunk. This is, this is a twin size bed. It fits four hu grown humans. She's one of the most amazing editors that you'll ever find. Oh, thanks, Karen. <sighs> Yes, editing. If you have any questions for a documentary editor, now is the time to pop into the comment section, write us a question. We'll ask it right now, live on the air. Uh, 
quick introduction and uh, what Nubby. you do. Hi. Fancy meeting you here. It's, yeah. it's a pleasure. I know. Nice. It's nice and cozy. Strangers in bed. When was that's the last right. time you met a stranger in bed? Oh, well, we don't need to go into things like that. Oh, that's right. Sorry. We'll keep it PG-13. My mom might be watching. That, oh, well, that, okay. Sorry. See, now you made me nervous. Right, right. Sorry, mom. My bad. <laughs> uh, editing a documentary. And not just any documentary, one that is about a director, a filmmaker. It's a, uh, it's That's a like a little more pressure. Sure. It was a huge undertaking, just a mere eight months. That's it. That's it. So how many, first of all, what kind of chair do you use to make sure you don't get back pains? Hmm. A really cheap one. I, I get back pain, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah, I work, you know, got a little hole of an office. Um, so we worked in tight quarters, but nothing this tight. So no light, <laughs> no light, just just the light from the screen. It's sort of. We've, I've got a tiny little window. It's nice. Excellent. Well, what can you tell us about editing? You know, what you get a chance to to see everything, and you get to kind of pick and choose. You put your fingerprint on what you feel is the best best story to tell. I'd like to think so. I mean, you work with all directors and producers, and everyone's got a way they like to work. And Lewis was really um, brilliant and in the way that he um, he did let me choose uh, takes and, and interview pieces. And um, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful working relationship. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Karen, the voice from the bar. All right. Does Richard have serious cognitive dissonance about being a true indie filmmaker and then suddenly going all Hollywood? Uh, he, he has no cognitive dissonance whatsoever because he sees no problem. He has gotten on occasion, he has gotten Hollywood to get, give him the money to make a film he wanted to make. And he has made the film he wanted to make. But, uh, but in, in no way is that is, is some biography anything but homogeneous and consistently independent and very much Rick didn't get to make all the films he wanted to make but all the films he made or films he wanted to. So you you guys have been in this business a long time, right? Especially uh, uh, Lewis being around a film festival, starting your own festival in Austin, Texas. What are some of the trends that you're seeing this year? What, 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 are, what are things that people are doing that impresses you, that surprises you? Where is the future of filmmaking going in the next couple of years? I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that. I, 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 would, I, I would love to be more supportive. This was a great question. Yeah. And I don't want to leave you hanging there. But actually, this is a discussion that I'm involved in all the time with all kinds of different people. And in the past, the way things changed in media, well, sometimes that didn't change for decades. And when it changed, it changed slowly. In the last 20 years, it's changed ridiculously fast. And I don't think anybody knows where it's going. I would See, now it. that's a fair question, or that's a that's an honest response. People who think they know probably don't, right? I, you know, yes. Okay, I so... it's going to have a lot to do with how we see films, not necessarily how we make them. Right. But at the end of the day, the story is really all that matters. you got to have a good story. This is true. Okay, now it's time for the final five. Okay, okay. this is the last five questions that we're going to okay. sprint five. through these very quickly, okay? Question number five, where do you go when you need uninterrupted creativity? When you need to go somewhere in a creative space and not be bothered, how do you do it? Where do you go? I have a great office in the house. This office I really, in the house. I have a great office in the house, and that's where I go. Mine's in smaller spurts of the shower. Definitely in the shower. Yeah. You know, so 10, many good ideas come in the shower. A burst of creativity. I feel you there. Okay, next one. Number four, do you work better getting up early or staying up late? I, I now have the advantage of whatever I feel like working, I can work. So whatever sometimes I get up early and work, and sometimes I get up at three and four. And so five you don't have a routine. You I just kind of roll with it. I spend more of the day awake usually. Yeah. But, um, and I don't usually work late but I work all through the night. Gotcha. I have three kids, so getting up early mm -hmm. is- You don't have uh, a choice. It's beneficial. Yeah, exactly. All right, we have our third final five question. What's a creative killer? 
What's something you try and stay away, away from so it doesn't kill your creativity? You can go first. Good. Go I, I, um, what's a creative killer? I have three kids. I have to get up mm -hmm. in the morning. I mean, it's sort of nice to have that excuse to go to the office, so that's not a creative killer. Um, I cannot answer that question. I'm stumping everybody. I know you are. A, a creative killer is when I'm on kind of a conceptual roll and I get swamped with details, yeah. that, that, like small details about the, my businesses or quest. So when I'm trying to like just find the headspace to just think or write, right. and then other crap comes up. Gotcha. All right. No, no is a creative killer. Yeah. No. Number no, two. Yes or no. What's your biggest fear when making a film? What's your biggest fear when making a film? This one's easy, that Rick Linklater wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No chance, no chance. And then finally, your number one. I don't know, because oh. I don't know what my biggest fear is. There's too many, there's too many. And your number one question for the final five, what topic will be or should be covered, you think, in 2016? Oh my goodness, you, Lewis, don't keep making me go first. I went first a couple of times. <laughs> I thought I was being rude, actually. Yeah, you need to answer that. What needs to be talked about in 2016? That's the rule. Come on, Karen. Yeah, there you go. No, I'll do I'll lay across the pillows. Okay. There you go. Right. Lay across the top. What, nice. Here's the microphone. What needs to be answered, covered in 2016? What's a topic that filmmakers should be covering in 2016? Oh my God, do you want me to get all serious? Yeah. Oh, totally. uh, yeah. Um, Take it where you want to um, go. Um, 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 um. Oh, God. I like I never thought about this before. Um, here, I want to make sure that you're comfortable. Well, it's the you hot seat. Lay, as soon as they lay your head right here. I really don't know. I want to make sure you're comfortable. Lay your head right here, please. Uh, I know, I would, I would just say whatever they feel most passionately about. I mean, it's, you know, I think, I think that it's, it's um, there are so many stories out there to be told, right? There are so many stories out there to be told. Um, I just think that people should continue to tell stories and use all the new products that are out there in the universe to do it, you know, whatever way that they have to. But I mean, politically, I mean, environmentally, there's so many stories to tell if you think about it. You there's know? too many. There's too many stories too to many. tell. So, you there's know, too many stories, too so many no stories. excuse many not many to no make excuse. one. Exactly. No excuse. Well, guys, I want to thank you for uh, right. joining me in my bed. Right. Thank you so much. This was equally awesome yeah. and awkward at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so pumped that you guys joined me. Thank, thank you. you so Enjoy much. the rest of your Sundance. Okay, thank Bye you. Bye-bye. See you guys.